So I'm pleased to introduce our guest, John Kerry, our nation's first special presidential envoy for climate and the first principal to sit on the National Security Council dedicated to climate change. I think you know, prior to his current service, Secretary Kerry was the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace's first ever visiting distinguished statesman. He was our country's top diplomat for four years as the 68th United States Secretary of State. He's a decorated combat veteran and served 25 years in the US Senate. And as many of you know, Secretary Kerry is a distinguished fellow at Yale in the Jackson Institute and a member of the Yale College class of 1966. So Secretary Kerry, thank you for joining us today. And we've gathered uh, a lot of questions for you. So I wanna jump right in. Uh, I know you'll be representing uh, the United States at the 2021 <coughs> Uh, United Nations Climate Change Conference at the end of the year. And we'd be interested in hearing what your goals are for, for that event. Well, Peter, first of all, it's great to be with the Yale Climate Day. And Michael, thank you. And Peter, thank you for the invitation to be with you. Um, we are woefully behind where we ought to be on an international basis. In Paris, we all agreed to keep the Earth's temperature increase well below two degrees and if possible at 1.5 degrees centigrade. And uh, the truth is that uh, we're far from that. Uh, we knew in Paris that even if everybody did what they were gonna do, we'd still rise in temperature to about 3.7 degrees. And because we're not doing everything people said they would do, we're actually heading to four degrees or more. So it's quite fundamentally catastrophic. On the upside, we have the ability to avoid the worst consequences of climate. We really can do this. But the next 10 years are absolutely critical. So the goal at Glasgow is to bring global ambition way up. We had a summit in the White House uh, last month that President Biden hosted. That summit resulted in about 55% of global GDP being committed to keep to the 1.5 degrees. And that includes Japan, Canada, the United States, the UK, Europe, et cetera. But we're now working with the other 45%. That's the diplomacy of the next six months. How do we bring everybody else on board to change their national determined contribution, NDC as it's called, raise their ambition so that we lay out a plan, literally a roadmap for 10 years to get to 2030 with uh, preserving 1.5 degrees and then building on the plans to go to 2050 net zero, which more and more people are now adopting. The problem is, Peter, we don't want to be stuck with a whole bunch of, wow, we're for 2050 net zero. That's our deal because it doesn't get us there. You've got to get people to buy into the next 10 years. That's the goal of Glasgow. That and finance and then what's called the rule book. We need to kind of close out the rules by which we're going to implement this over the next years. You're, you know, you're mentioning uh, uh, the setting of goals and uh, the long-term orientation that, that many have when we need a, we need a decade, uh, this decade orientation. But it's true that, uh, you know, with your help, many institutions, many uh, uh, companies, financial companies, uh, others, uh, universities as well, have made pledges to reduce emissions and uh, have set goals for themselves. How, how can we be sure, uh, how can we have confidence that there are concrete paths toward meeting these goals and that these institutions actually put them in place rather than just put the goal on a sign and, and hope for the best? Well, that's, that's partly the rule book that we, I just talked about, which is going to require uh, you know, updated data. But secondly, we now have available to us, Peter, an extraordinary array of digital space-based and other means of tracking what people are doing. Al Gore has worked on the development of a thing called Trace along with climate activists and others. It's creating an ability to be able to have real-time readout on exactly what the footprint of a global company is or of an institution. I mean, you could from space focus in on Yale and you can read out exactly what Yale's emissions are at that point in time and extrapolate. So that, you know, public shaming, public accountability is gonna be one of the things as people buy into a global endeavor. 
Uh, we're not able to have force of law for a number of different reasons. Uh, so this really does rely on leveraging people. But here's the other big thing that is happening, <clears throat> and it's really exciting. Private capital. <clears throat> there is no government in the world that has enough money to be able to close the finance gap that the UN has identified. There's a one to two trillion dollar per year finance gap just for the energy sector in the transition we need to make in the next 30 years. So how do you do this? Well, we've gone to individual finance institutions. We've got six of the largest banks in America. They've created a floor of a commitment over the next 10 years that will put uh, uh, about uh, $4.16 trillion to use for climate investment <clears throat> during that period of time. And that's without factoring in a bunch of asset managers. When you take an entity like BlackRock, BlackRock is probably going to put another trillion in, maybe two over the course of 10 years, who knows? But if you start adding this up, uh, the accrued amount of investment is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen. And people are already moving there. Look at, look at Tesla. The value of Tesla is more than, uh, more than Exxon Mobil, BP, uh, Chevron put together. And, and all it does is make electric cars. All it does. I mean, that's not minimalist. But uh, the, the race now to, to zero emissions vehicles is intense. And you've got major automobile companies. GM says they're going to have no more internal combustion engines after 2035. Ford is moving in the same direction. European uh, car makers moving in the same direction. So the momentum of the marketplace is also going to provide a level of impetus as well as accountability in my judgment. And uh, people are going to demand this. this. This has taken on, thanks to young people sort of speaking out and and screaming about the future, I, I think finally people are saying, wait a minute, there's actually money to be made in this enterprise. We build out the grid of America. We build cars. There's more work. Fat, one of the fastest growing jobs in America is wind turbine technician. Third fastest growing job in America, solar panel installer. And, and so there are going to be a lot of changes in our economy that come from this. I think it's the biggest transformation, Peter, since the Industrial Revolution, bigger by far than the technology revolution of the 1990s in computer, desk computers and mobile phones and so forth. This is going to be gigantic. And I think the marketplace realizes it. And every boardroom in America is now grappling with ESG considerations, environment, social and governance. And you also have the sustainable development goals of the United Nations that are hanging over people. So. You know, we may finally see a moment of global responsibility, but as I said, 45% has still not signed up and we've got to move those countries. And they're big, China, India, Russia, some of the biggest emitters on the planet. 20 countries are the equivalent of about 75% of all emissions. We are gonna continue to work with those 20 countries. You, uh, you were mentioning young people in your, in your answer to that question. And of course, we're a university and we have many students uh, who are uh, watching this symposium today and participating in Climate Day. <clears throat> and uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts about what uh, students, what younger people can, uh, uh, can do to influence climate policy. And in particular, uh, uh, you know, what are the skills that you need if you really want to be um, someone who works on the policy front and uh, maybe has a career like yours? Well, I think the skill set, Peter, is the same as skill sets in other disciplines. I mean, you know, if you're a decent student and whatever it is you do, if you want to focus on climate, it's there to be focused on and we need you uh, desperately. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, I mean, Yale's doing a great job in the various schools of uh, instilling a lot of interest in people. I was privileged in my fellows and, and in my seminar to have people who were just super motivated and focused, uh, a couple of whom I bumped into down here in Washington. You know, one's working in the White House, one's working in the State Department. I mean, it happens very quickly. So um, the fact is that young people historically, and I say this with some measure of pride, because in the 1960s, 
A lot of us became involved in the civil rights movement of 64, 65, in the environment movement, the women's movement, the peace movement, the war in Vietnam. And the first thing I did, I remember, was marching in, and not just marching, but organizing Earth Day in Massachusetts and New England back in 1970. That, that mobilization of voters is ultimately what happened, was a moment of accountability based on environment. And immediately, the Congress passed the Clean Air Act, safe drinking water, marine mammal protection, coastal zone management, uh, endangered species, and we created the Environmental Protection Agency of our country. That came out of young people, student activism, people going out and holding the system accountable. To a large measure, that's happened already. Uh, with respect, I think, 20, I think 2020 is the first election since 1970 in which environment was in fact a voting issue. And President Biden seized on it, had a major proposal in the context of the campaign. He's implementing it now, rejoining Paris, leading on the summit, beginning getting a 50 to 52 percent target to reduce in America. I think young folks ought to look at that and say, gosh, you know, we really played a role in helping to make that happen. But boy, are we not finished. This transition is going to be a fight and we need everybody involved in this fight. Yeah. You know, Yale has such a long history of uh, uh, educating uh, uh, young people for service to state and community. And uh, uh, I, of course, hope that will continue. We're trying to give students as many opportunities as we can to uh, uh, learn those skills and, and uh, be inspired by people like you and uh, participate in uh, what's going on in Washington, or for that matter, in Hartford or New Haven. Um, Speaking of politics, uh, what, uh, you know, we're, we, we have such highly uh, polarized political debate in this country now. And, uh, you know, climate, even climate change, I say even climate change, climate change is highly politicized uh, as well. And yet it's going to really take a, a united effort, it would seem, uh, to develop uh, solutions and to, uh, Address the address the crisis in just the ways that you suggest. What what can we do? And is the role for universities, um, in addition to our convening function, uh, to uh, help bridge these political divides and get people on the same page, and not make this yet another area where a big swath of the country simply um, is not interested in engaging. Well, Peter, that's boy, that's the big, uh, that's the big challenge to the country, I and mean, it's the big question. Um, to some measure, Yale's motto addresses that. Lux et veritas. Um, we need truth. We don't have a baseline for truth in our in our system right now. Uh, people actually have the ability and have been creating their own facts. Uh, creating their own reality. Look at what's happening with uh, President Trump. I mean, I don't want to politicize this, but what's happening in this context of, 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 of the big lie and the big steal. Uh, if, if that's the motivation of a major party in our country, we really have a problem in trying to get things done in a bipartisan fashion. And the only thing I can really honestly think of to say to people is there's no automatic pilot for democracy. You, you don't just cruise along. You can't cruise along. You have to fight for what is the truth. You have to fight for it. Now, that's been happening in, in you know, the demonstrations and after George Floyd, uh, the, the, the police reform initiative now, other kinds of things are emanating out of this struggle. And the victory of uh, President Biden is, in fact, a reflection of, that, of, of a large part of that battle. He ran on restoring the soul of our country. Yeah. And, and wanting to restore uh, some norms, not every norm, not everything should be normal in the same way all the time. Change is change and we embrace it. But it can't be reckless, autocratic, authoritarian, anti-democratic change in the United States of America that people fall into because they feel powerless or weak or frustrated by what is uh, not happening. We, we have to fight for that very, very hard. And given what's happening in these laws being passed around the country in many, many legislatures that are going to make it harder for people to vote, 
I think that is a recipe for the potential of, of real implosion of violence. I mean, because what it's trying to do is legitimize the steel, actually have a steel, create the, the predicate for it. And, and that is going to require us to uh, also fight back. So, you know, this generation of Yale students is graduating at a moment where we're not sending, you know, a lot of troops off to another country to die. And that's the cause of, of action. But what ought to be the cause of action is their freedom and liberty and the baseline of truth by which we can actually function as a democracy, because without it, you don't and you can't and you won't. Certainly agree. The, um, you, I know we don't have a lot of time, but let me bring it back to Yale uh, for just a moment. Um, as you know, we have announced a, a planetary solutions campus-wide project uh, that uh, uh, supports interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research uh, on all things relevant to climate change uh, and its consequences. Uh, we engage in campus behaviors to try to change um, our, our own, um, uh, make ourselves accountable for the cost of carbon we emit and uh, be a model. Uh, and uh, we recently announced some new guidelines by which we're going to evaluate holdings in our endowment uh, where fossil fuel uh, production extraction is, is concerned. Um, very recently, we received a very large gift from FedEx to support research uh, as part of this uh, uh, Planetary Solutions Project to support research uh, on natural methods of carbon capture. Um, and I'd be interested if you have, if, you, if, if there are areas of research that you think, why isn't anybody studying this? Where, what could Yale be focusing its attention on through our Planetary Solutions Project that you think is an understudied aspect of climate change or its uh, remediation uh, that uh, we, we should seriously try to organize ourselves around? Direct air capture. Yeah. I mean, if we can figure out how to suck this stuff out of the atmosphere and put it to use, we're in, we're in the catbird seat. Uh, two to three weeks of storage. That's Katie bar the door. Uh, that's, uh, you, you just, that's it. We've solved the problem. And um, I think, uh, uh, I mean, I think those are the biggest. Obviously, a lot of people are chasing green hydrogen now. Uh, there's a lot of uh, global endeavor for that. I think it's going to be one of the fuels of the future without any question. But the, the, the challenge for us, P Peter, is can we move fast enough? Not will we move. Ultimately, we're going to get there. And a certain percentage of the population of the planet will kind of, you know, learn how they'll adapt and things will happen and we'll waste a lot of money doing things we never should have had to do to survive as a species. But uh, a lot of people won't there will be a massive dislocation of human beings with major food disruption and other challenges. So the issue here is speeding everything up. If we can find ways to speed it up, we've got a much better chance of arresting the melting of Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheet and the other major disruptions that are coming uh, at, at an alarming pace right now. Um, and so that's what I'd say. I mean. You know, uh, Bill Gates in his book uh, cites that we need the one of three miracles, the miracle of storage, the miracle of fusion, or the miracle of fission. Uh, and he's pursuing the fission with a next generation model nuclear reactor, uh, which has a lot of promise. But the fact is that, a, that the scientists tell me that about 50% of the emissions we need to get to reach net zero are going to come from technologies we don't have today. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of open season. I mean, I think Yale, well advised. I think that's great money that FedEx is, is, is invested. That is the great endeavor, uh, is to chase any number of those possibilities, recognizing, you know, there are a lot of people in certain sectors. You may want to isolate one or two, you know, particular avenues that is not quite as a path as trod, so well trod, and come up with something. But those are the biggies. 
uh, and, and methane, anybody who can find a way, you know, we got a, we had a serious methane challenge because the melting of the permafrost and the melting of the tundra and, and, the, and the massive exposure of 30 and 40,000 year frozen land to a thawing is emitting massive amount of heretofore contained methane. And methane is, you know, 20 to 80 times more damaging, more destructive than CO2. And it's now coming out in amounts that are truly alarming, which will also exacerbate the gas debate because gas is 87.7% methane and it leaks. It leaks far more in other countries than here, but we're at about a 5% leakage. And you add to that the untapped, uh, unplugged wells and mines from which methane is escaping. Uh, one of President Biden's priorities in the, in the infrastructure bill is the capping of those mines and those wells. So those are the challenges. And um, I think those are sort of the centerpiece challenges. Right. Well, Senator Kerry, uh, Secretary Kerry, we appreciate you uh, giving us time today. And I want to allow you to have the final word, but uh, just to make sure that there's time to express a little gratitude, I want to thank you for kicking uh, kicking off Climate Day for us. And uh, we miss you on campus. Uh, it was great uh, uh, when uh, you could be with us uh, more regularly. And uh, at some point, we look forward to welcoming you back uh, 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 in a more regularized way. In the meantime, it is great to see you through Zoom and we, we do appreciate you spending some time uh, with us. Um, but well, Peter, uh, thank any you. final words, any final words for our uh, students? Who yeah, are I mean, final, well, first of all, thank you, Peter, to you and thank My you to Yale. Thanks to Yale for doing the, the Climate Day. Um, my, my uh, on, a, on a note of optimism, which we ought to end on is, this is so doable. That's what's so frustrating about it. Mm -hmm. We know that we can move to massive level of, re of renewable usage. And then you just need to balance sort of 10 or 15% of your energy needs. Batteries are now reaching a four hour uh, length of time for utility scale batteries. And there are communities on the planet that are at decarbonized status. There are about four or five of them and, and more coming. So we, we can accelerate this. And, and I see just fantastic opportunity to, to, to make America fairer, to deal with environmental injustice that has characterized a lot of the build out and development of the last 40, 50 years. Uh, you know, we, we, we can, we can uh, I think, create millions, not I think, all of the job you know, analyses for the long-term future show that there are far, far more uh, jobs to be created in by going whole hog into this arena of cleaning up the planet uh, and, and uh, building out the new systems that will modernize our nations, lengthen our lives and increase the quality of life, make us more secure, all of those things. And every economic analysis shows it's far, far more expensive to not tackle this than it is to tackle it. And we're already seeing that. We spent $265 billion just cleaning up after three storms a couple of years ago. You know, Irma, Harvey, and Maria. We, we, we can do better than this. And in the doing better, we will make our society stronger, more resilient, uh, fairer, uh, and more prosperous. Uh, and, and healthier. And, and so I'm excited about the prospects. I really think this is worth the fight. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for those encouraging, optimistic uh, words. Uh, um, we certainly have a big challenge ahead of us as a university and as a country. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us uh, once again, Secretary Kerry, and I want to you, welcome Jerry. everybody to uh, Climate Day and uh, uh, very much hope uh, that it will be a stimulating day for everybody participating with us today. Thank you so much for being with us.